The original purpose of hell, as explained in scripture, was not for humanity but for Satan, Hebrew Shetan, Satanus in Greek, and his fallen angels. These beings rebelled against God, and hell was prepared as their place of judgment. In Matthew 25, verse 41, ESV, Jesus says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The word used for hell in this context is Gehenna, Gehenna, derived from the Hebrew Gehinnom, Gehinnom, a valley outside Jerusalem associated with idolatry and child sacrifice, which later symbolized a place of eternal punishment. Satan, also known as Lucifer, which is from the Latin translation of Helo ben Shahar, or Morning Star, Son of Dawn, from Isaiah 14.12, and the fallen angels Malachim Hanephilim, Nephilim, were cast out of heaven after their rebellion, Revelation 12.79. So, hell was originally intended to be the final destination for them as a place of eternal punishment and separation from God's presence. When it comes to humanity, hell also became a place of judgment for unrepentant sinners after the fall of Adam, Genesis 3. Romans 5.12 explains that through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and through sin came death, both physical and spiritual. As a result, those who reject God's grace and remain in their sinful state will also face eternal separation in hell, as the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. In this sense, hell reflects God's justice, as his holiness cannot tolerate sin. Jewish beliefs on hell. In Jewish tradition, the concept of hell is somewhat different. The Hebrew scriptures, Tanakh, primarily refer to Sheol, a place where all the dead go, both righteous and wicked. It is a shadowy, neutral place rather than a place of torment. Over time, Jewish thought developed more ideas about judgment, and by the time of the Second and Temple period, more distinct views of the afterlife emerged. One Jewish understanding of hell is called Gehenna, but it, it differs from the Christian concept. Jewish belief, Gehenna is often viewed as a place of purification rather than eternal punishment. Souls are sent there for a limited period, often said to be no more than 12 months, where they experience suffering to be purified of their sins. After this, the soul can either move to a place of peace or, for extremely wicked individuals, face destruction. Jewish beliefs focus more on repentance and the possibility of redemption, even after death. Eternal damnation, as emphasized in Christianity, is not as central to Jewish thought, which leans more toward purification or annihilation rather than endless torment. Yes, the Bible describes hell using various terms and imagery, providing a broad understanding of what it is and what happens there. The descriptions are often metaphorical and emphasize hell as a place of punishment, separation from God, and torment for the wicked and unrepentant. Let's break down some key terms and descriptions. 1. Gehenna Gehenna. As mentioned earlier, Gehenna is one of the primary terms Jesus uses to describe hell. It comes from the Hebrew Gehinnom, Valley of Hinnom, a valley outside Jerusalem that had a notorious history. In the Old Testament, this valley was associated with idolatrous worship and the horrific practice of child sacrifice to the god Molech, Jeremiah 7, 31. By the time of the New Testament, it had become a symbol of divine judgment and eternal punishment. Jesus uses Gehenna to depict hell as a place of fiery punishment. For example, Matthew 5, or 22, Jesus warns that whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire, Gehenna. Mark 9, verse 43 to 48, Jesus describes hell as a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die, emphasizing its eternal, consuming nature. 2. The Lake of Fire. In the book of Revelation, hell is described as a lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 40 to 15, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Here, the lake of fire represents the final judgment and eternal punishment for the devil, the false prophet, and all those whose names are not written in the book of life. Re Revelation, Revelation 21, 8, the lake of fire is referred to as the second death, where the cowardly, faithless, and other unrepentant sinners are cast. The lake of fire is the ultimate depiction of hell as, as a place of eternal suffering and separation from God. Shuri, Sheol, and Hades, Adis, Sheol, is the Hebrew term found in the Old Testament that refers to the place of the dead. 
It is often depicted as a shadowy, neutral realm where both the righteous and the wicked go after death. It is not as developed as the Christian concept of hell, but it laid the groundwork for later ideas. In the New Testament, Hades, the Greek equivalent of Sheol, is used similarly, referring to the realm of the dead. However, it also starts to carry more connotations of punishment. Luke 16, 23, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man is in Hades, a place of torment and separation from God, while Lazarus is comforted in Abraham's bosom. Revelation 1.18 Jesus declares that he holds the keys of death and Hades, signifying his authority over death and the afterlife. Part 4. Outer darkness, another description of hell, hell is as a place of outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8 verse 12, Jesus says that the sons of the kingdom who reject him will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22 or 13, in the parable of the wedding feast, those who are unworthy are cast into the outer darkness. This imagery portrays hell as a place of extreme sorrow and regret, where people are cut off from the light of God's presence. 5. Eternal Fire Several passages in the New Testament describe hell as a place of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels as well as for the wicked. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jude 1, 7. The punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah is said to serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. This emphasizes the unending nature of the suffering and torment in hell. Number 6. Descriptions of Torment The Bible also provides several descriptions of the torment in hell, often using vivid imagery. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 13-42, uh, Luke 13-28. This phrase is repeatedly used to describe the agony and regret that people will experience in hell. Unquenchable fire, Mark 9, 43. Jesus describes the fire in hell as something that will never go out, symbolizing the endlessness of the suffering. Un dying, dying worm. This image comes from Isaiah 66, verse, verse 24, and portrays hell as a place where decay and suffering never cease. Uh, Jewish beliefs and hell. In Jewish thought, as mentioned earlier, the primary concept of the afterlife in the Old Testament is Sheol. Gehenna, in Jewish belief, became associated with judgment and punishment, but many Jews view it as more of a temporary state of purification rather than an eternal punishment. Unlike Christianity, where hell is often seen as a place of eternal separation from God, in Jewish eschatology, Gehenna is generally thought to last for a limited period, often no longer than 12 months, after which souls either enter a state of rest or are annihilated. The most wicked may face permanent destruction, but the idea of eternal conscious torment is not as central in Jewish theology. Conclusion The Bible describes hell in multiple ways, focusing on its role as a place of judgment, punishment, and separation from God. Whether it's called Gehenna, the lake of fire, outer darkness, or Hades, hell is consistently depicted as a place of conscious torment for those who reject God's grace. The imagery of fire, darkness, and weeping emphasizes the severity and seriousness of this eternal separation from God. According to scripture, all humans are deserving of hell because of sin. The Bible teaches that every person by nature is sinful and falls short of God's perfect standard of holiness. Romans 3, 23 states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This means that, due to the inherent sinfulness of mankind, no one is righteous on their own. All have sinned. From the very beginning, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, sin entered the world, and with it came death and condemnation. Romans 5 verse 12 explains, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Because Adam was humanity's representative, his fall into sin affected all of his descendants. As a result, every human is born with a sinful nature, and that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 2. Romans 6, 23 adds, For the wages of sin is death. The death here is not just physical death, but eternal death, separation from God in hell. Sin earns us this penalty, and as all have sinned, all deserve this punishment. 2. Unrepentant sinners. 
While all are deserving of hell because of sin, the Bible specifically highlights that those who remain unrepentant and reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ will face eternal judgment in hell. In John 3.36 ESV, Jesus says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This underscores that without faith in Christ, people remain under God's wrath, which ultimately results in eternal punishment. Revelation 21 verse 8 provides a list of those who will experience the second death in the lake of fire, hell. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This passage emphasizes that persistent, unrepentant sin leads to eternal separation from God. 3. Those who reject Jesus The ultimate rejection that leads to hell is the rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus says in John 14, 6, ESV, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Therefore, those who do not place their faith in Christ and his finished work on the cross remain under God's judgment. Hebrews 10, or 26 to 27, warns about rejecting the gospel. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. This shows that those who reject God's offer of grace through Jesus remain deserving of hell. Part 4. The Righteous Judgment of God It is important to recognize that hell is a manifestation of God's perfect justice. Since God is holy and just, sin must be punished. Psalm 89.14 Revelation 16 verse 7 declares, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Those who end up in hell are not there unjustly. They are receiving the due punishment for their sin and rejection of God. 5. Grace through Christ The good news is that, although everyone is deserving of hell, God has provided a way of escape through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 8-9 ESV tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is a free gift that God offers to those who believe in Jesus, repent of their sins, and trust in his finished work on the cross. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Conclusion Ultimately, everyone is deserving of hell because of their sin. But those who repent and trust in Jesus Christ are saved from that judgment. God, uh, in His grace, provides salvation through Christ. But those who reject that offer of grace will face the eternal consequences of their sin in hell. Ultimately, those who reject Jesus Christ and die in their sins go to hell. According to scripture, every human is born deserving of hell because of sin, Romans 3 verse 23. But God in his grace provides a way of salvation through faith in Christ. Those who do not repent and trust in Jesus remain under God's judgment and face eternal punishment in hell. 1. Unbelievers and Rejectors of Christ The Bible is clear that those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will face eternal punishment in hell. John 3 verse 18 ESV says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This makes it clear that hell is the ultimate destination for those who do not believe in Christ. Jesus is the only way to salvation, John 14 verse 6, and those who do not place their faith in him for the forgiveness of their sins will experience God's righteous judgment. In John 3, 36 ESV, Jesus says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. 2. Those who persist in unrepentant sin. Although all are sinners, those who persist in their sin without repentance and do not turn to Christ for salvation will face hell. Romans 2 verse 5 ESV warns, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Revelation 21 verse 8 gives a specific list of the types of people who will ultimately end up in hell, the lake of fire. 
But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This indicates that those who remain in unrepentant sin without accepting God's grace in Christ will experience the eternal consequences of their actions. Number three, the devil and fallen angels. Hell was originally created for Satan and his fallen angels. Matthew 25, 41 ESV says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. At the final judgment, Satan, along with the demons, will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 10. While Satan and his demons currently have influence in the world, their ultimate fate is eternal punishment in hell. Now, number four, those who reject the gospel after knowing the truth. The Bible also warns of the severe consequences for those who knowingly reject the truth of the gospel. Hebrews 10, 26 to 27 says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Those who consciously turn away from the gospel after hearing it remain under God's judgment. A five, eternal separation from God. Ultimately, hell is a place of eternal separation from God. And those who go there are those who have rejected God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 1, 8, 9 ESV explains that Jesus will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Hell is described as a place of outer darkness, Matthew 8, 12, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 13, 42, and eternal fire, 9, 48. This imagery conveys the reality of eternal separation from God for God for those who reject him. Conclusion. In the end, those who reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation, persist in unrepentant sin and die without having their sins forgiven, will go to hell. While hell was originally prepared for Satan and his fallen angels, all who refuse to accept God's grace through Christ will face eternal punishment there. However, for those who place their faith in Jesus, there is eternal life with God, free from judgment and wrath. Yes, from a biblical perspective, hell is just because it reflects God's perfect justice, holiness, and righteousness. Let's explore why hell is considered just in the context of Reformed theology and scripture. One, God's holiness and justice. God is perfectly holy and just, meaning he cannot overlook sin or allow it to go unpunished. Scripture describes God as a righteous judge who always does what is right. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. God's justice flows from his very nature, and because he is holy, he cannot allow sin to exist in his presence without consequence. Romans 3, verse 25 to 26, ESV explains how God's justice and mercy work together. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, God remains just even while offering salvation through Jesus, as sin is still punished, but the punishment falls on Christ for those who believe. Sin deserves eternal punishment. From a reformed viewpoint, sin is not just an offense against another person. It is ultimately an offense against an infinitely holy God. Since God is infinite and eternal, the gravity of sin against him is infinitely serious. In Romans 6, verse 23, Paul states, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The death here refers not only to physical death, but to eternal separation from God, what is called the second death in Revelation 21, 8, the lake of fire or hell. God's justice requires that sin be punished, and the punishment for sin is eternal, given the eternal nature of God. Hell is the rightful consequence of rejecting God and continuing in sin. 3. The Fairness of Hell Some might struggle with the idea that eternal punishment could be fair for finite sins committed in a limited lifespan. 
However, the issue is not the duration of the sin, but the nature of whom the sin is against. Every sin is rebellion against an infinite God, so the punishment is proportionate to the offense. A key text for understanding this is Luke 12, verse 47 to 48, where Jesus explains that those who know their master's will and reject it will receive a greater punishment than those who sin in ignorance. This, this suggests that there may be degrees of punishment in hell uh, based on the level of knowledge and responsibility. Hell is not unjust because it is the deserved penalty for willfully rejecting God's righteousness and salvation through Christ. How four, hell and human responsibility. Hell is just because those who end up there have made a conscious choice to reject God's offer of salvation. The gospel offers eternal life through Jesus Christ, but those who refuse to repent and believe are choosing separation from God. John 3, 19 ESV says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. People who end up in hell do so because they reject the light of Christ and persist in sin. Five, God's patience and mercy. God's justice in sending people to hell must also be viewed in light of his incredible patience and mercy. Second Peter 3, 9 explains, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God does not delight in sending anyone to hell. In fact, he offers countless opportunities for repentance through the gospel. When someone refuses to repent, it is not because God didn't offer them salvation. It is because they chose to remain in rebellion against him. Hummer 6. Jesus paid the price. Hell is just, but God's justice was fully satisfied for believers through the work of Christ on the cross. Jesus took the punishment for sin, enduring the wrath of God that was rightfully due to us. Isaiah 53, 5 ESV says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. God's justice is upheld because the punishment for sin has been paid, either by the sinner in hell or by Christ for those who believe. Conclusion Hell is just because it upholds God's perfect holiness and justice. Sin is an offense against an infinitely holy God and the appropriate punishment is eternal separation from Him. Those who reject God's offer of salvation through Christ bear the consequences of their sin. While hell is a difficult doctrine, it is consistent with the biblical understanding of God's justice, human responsibility, and the seriousness of sin. However, through Christ, God offers salvation and a way to escape the just penalty of hell for those who trust in him. Yes, according to scripture, hell is described as eternal. The Bible consistently uses language that affirms the everlasting nature of hell, emphasizing the finality and unending duration of this state of judgment. Here are the key reasons why hell is understood to be eternal. Sure one, Jesus' teaching on hell's eternity. Jesus himself spoke often about the eternal nature of hell. In Matthew 25, verse 46, v, he says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This verse clearly contrasts eternal punishment, hell, with eternal life, heaven. The same word for eternal, ionios in Greek, is used for both, meaning that just as the life of the saved is eternal, so is the punishment of the lost. In Mark 9, 48, Jesus describes hell as a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The imagery of an unquenchable fire and an undying worm suggests a punishment that does not end. Tar 2, Revelation's description of hell. The book of Revelation also supports the eternal nature of hell. In Revelation 14, verse 11, ESV, it says of those who worship the beast, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. The phrase forever and ever, literally in Greek, eis tus ionas ton ionon, indicates unending duration. Additionally, in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This further underscores the eternal nature of hell as a place of ongoing punishment. The nature of sin and justice. In Reformed theology, hell is eternal because it reflects the infinite seriousness of sin against an infinitely holy God. Since God is eternal, the offense of sin against him carries eternal consequences. 
the punishment must fit the offense, and sin against an eternal holy God warrants an eternal penalty. This concept is supported by Romans 6, 23 ESV, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as eternal life is the reward of those who trust in Christ, in Christ, eternal death or separation from God is the penalty for those who reject him. 4. Finality of Judgment Hebrews 9.27 ESV says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There is no indication in scripture that there is a second chance after death. The judgment that comes after death is final, and those who are condemned are cast into eternal separation from God. Jesus described hell as the outer darkness, Matthew 8.12, and eternal fire, Matthew 25.41, highlighting the finality of the judgment and the ongoing nature of the punishment. Number five, arguments for eternal punishment. There are a few additional theological reasons why hell is understood to be eternal. The nature of the soul. Human souls, human souls are created to exist forever. Those who are saved will live eternally in God's presence, while those who reject God will exist eternally in separation from him. Since souls are eternal, the judgment they receive must also be eternal. No repentance after death the Bible teaches that the time for repentance is in this life, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. After death, the opportunity for salvation is over, and there is no indication in scripture of a post-mortem chance to repent. Number six, is hell ever a temporary state? Some people argue for alternative views, such as annihilationism, which suggests that the wicked will be destroyed and cease to exist rather than suffering eternally. However, the consistent biblical language of eternal torment and punishment, as well as the parallel between eternal life and eternal punishment, strongly supports the traditional view that hell is eternal. 7. God's justice and hell. It's important to remember that hell, though eternal, is not unjust. God's justice demands that sin be punished, but he offers grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. For those who reject offer of grace, Hell is the result of their choice to remain in rebellion against God. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 ESV says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Now, this eternal separation from God is the final consequence of sin, but it is a just punishment for those who reject His authority and grace. Conclusion Hell is described as eternal in the Bible. Jesus' own teachings, the writings of the apostles, and the imagery used in the book of Revelation all affirm that the punishment of hell is everlasting. This reflects the seriousness of sin against an eternal God, and it underscores the urgency of turning to Christ for salvation while there is still time. Through faith in Jesus, we can escape the just and eternal punishment of hell and receive the gift of eternal life in his presence. To avoid hell and be sure of salvation, the Bible teaches that a person must place their faith in Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior, repenting of their sins and trusting in his work on the cross. Here's a breakdown of how someone can be sure of their salvation from a biblical and reformed perspective. 1. Acknowledge your sin. The first step toward salvation is recognizing that you are a sinner in need of saving. Romans 3.23 ESV says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This means that every person has broken God's law, and the consequence of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Romans 6 verse 23. Acknowledging your sinfulness and your need for forgiveness is key to understanding why you need a Savior. Repent of your sin. Repentance means turning away from sin and turning toward God. It's not just feeling sorry for sin, but genuinely seeking to live differently. Jesus himself said in Luke 13, 18, verse 3 ESV, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance is a heart change that turns you from living for yourself and your own desires to living for God, trusting in his ways. Believe in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the central and most important part of salvation. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, lived a sinless life and died on the cross, taking the punishment for the sins of all who would believe in him. 
He rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, offering eternal life to those who trust in him. Acts 16, 31 declares, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. It's not about doing good works to earn salvation. It's about placing your trust in Jesus and what he has done on your behalf. 4. Trust in Christ alone. Salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. Ephesians 2, 8-9 teaches, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You can't earn your way to heaven or avoid hell through good deeds. Salvation is a free gift from God, received by faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. Number 5. Rest in God's sovereignty. From a Reformed perspective, God is sovereign in salvation. The doctrine of election teaches that God chooses His people according to His will and grace. Ephesians 1, 4-5 If you have come to faith in Christ, it is because God has drawn you to Himself. John 6, 44 And you can trust that God's promises are secure. Romans 8, verse 30, ESV says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those those whom he justified, he also glorified. This gives believers great assurance that salvation is not something they can lose. 6. Seek assurance through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in the hearts of believers to give them assurance of their salvation. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you are truly saved, the Holy Spirit will produce evidence of this in your life. Fruit such as love, joy, peace, patience, and a growing desire to obey God's word. Galatians 5, 22-23 This fruit is a sign of the inward transformation God has worked in your heart. Number 7. Persevere in faith. True believers are called to persevere in their faith. Those who have genuinely trusted in Christ will remain in the faith because God sustains them. Philippians 1 6 ESV offers encouragement. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This means that God will continue to work in the lives of believers, helping them grow in their faith and holiness until they are with him forever. Rest in the promises of scripture. God's Word is full of promises that give believers assurance of their salvation. One of the most powerful promises is found in John 28 29 ESV, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. When you are in Christ, your salvation is secure. You can trust in his promise that he will never let you go. Conclusion, how to be sure of salvation. To avoid hell and be sure of salvation, one, acknowledge your sin and need for a savior. Two, repent of your sin and turn to God. Three, believe in Jesus Christ, trusting in his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. Four, trust in Christ alone for your salvation, resting in his finished work, not your own efforts. Five, rest in God's sovereign grace and the assurance of the Holy Spirit. 6. Persevere in faith, knowing that God will sustain you. 7. Rest in the promises of Scripture, trusting that your salvation is secure in Christ. By following these steps, you can be confident that your salvation is sure, and you will avoid hell, spending eternity with God through the grace provided by Jesus Christ.